enhanced rock weathering is a very straightforward, simple technology. You basically take ground up rocks, silicate rocks, and you apply them to the fields. And then the rainwater and the acidic environment within the soils breaks those rocks down. They undergo what we call chemical weathering. And that captures carbon dioxide. And, uh, and then you reapply the following year. So it's a very, you know, it's a very straightforward process. One of the issues with intensification of agriculture is that you tend to deplete your soils in micronutrients because the crops need these micronutrients to grow. And then we harvest the crops and you take that biomass off field. So slowly over time, you're depleting those pools of uh, nutrients. And so when you apply basalt and it weathers, then it releases things like potassium and phosphorus, molybdenum, iron, all, and silica, all of these trace elements that are important for crop health and for maintaining yields that we've basically de been depleting from our soils for, for decades. And so actually, you know, in, that, in that sense, it kind of restores soil health. And also could, because it has potassium and phosphorus in it, it could also reduce uh, fertilizer usage. And that's a big win because what happens is when you apply nitrogen fertilizers, the microbes in the soil tend to produce uh, nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is a, a greenhouse gas that's 300 times more powerful than CO2, carbon dioxide. So if you can apply a basalt and dial down the emissions of that greenhouse gas, then that's a big uh, co-benefit. The manufacturing of fertilizers has a high fossil fuel uh, cost. We've been leading a study in the US, Corn Belt in Illinois, out in those uh, very heavily farmed soils. So really striking responses from our first large-scale field trials. And we're seeing yield increases in soy and may on average of sort of 10 to 15 percent. And so, you know, that's very encouraging for deployment of this technology. How does this technology perform under UK conditions? That is one of the questions that we're starting to investigate with our own demonstrators. We have UK soils, cooler climates, and different sorts of basalts. You know, you need to evaluate each, each country on its, own, on its own merits. In terms of trying to understand how this technology might work, we've chosen the two dominant agricultural land uses in the, in the UK. So, so uh, lowland arable land, which covers about 6 million hectares, and also uh, grazing. So, you know, lowland grazing and upland grazing together are about 6 million hectares. So the idea is that having these representative land uses gives us an opportunity to understand and assess what the carbon removal potential is in agricultural land areas that are very scalable. So in terms of how do we measure the amount of carbon dioxide that's being removed during the weathering process, so one thing I've been looking at is the actual soil discharge waters. So the water that moves through the soil and into streams and eventually ends up in the ocean. So the carbon content of those waters starts to increase as the carbon dioxide that's dissolved in the rainwater attacks the rocks and converts the carbon dioxide into hydrogen carbonate ions that go into those soil waters where it's securely stored. And we measure the concentration of hydrogen carbonate ions that are being generated. And by comparing that to a uh, control plot, we can calculate the amount of weathering that's gone on and therefore the amount of carbon dioxide that has come from the atmosphere. And we're also looking at the soils themselves. So if we can uh, quantify the amount of um, dissolution of that rock material, uh, we can use that to also, also to calculate the amount of carbon dioxide that's being removed. And finally, we're looking at the plants. Uh, so we're looking at the amount of carbon dioxide that goes into the soil, we're looking at the amount that comes out of the soil, and we can use that to calculate how much of the carbon has gone into the rocks and therefore is securely stored. One issue that we're trying to deal with with enhanced weathering 
is really trying to understand what that time interval might be before the actual weathering process happening or the soils dissolving and the carbon being securely stored. And of course, it depends on a whole variety of things. It depends on the type of soil, it depends on the rock that we apply. So I'm working with the field sites and I'm also working with the modelers to make sure that the data that we get from the field experiments that are going on goes into those models and is used to validate and verify that those models are correct. We need to make sure that we're looking at the net carbon dioxide removal, not just what we're seeing on the field site. So that's a really important part of the, our calculations. So we can do calculations which show actually that the mining of the rock is, in terms of the emissions is, is relatively trivial. Um, actually, more important is transportation of rock dust because you know, during the transport system before we electrify, you know, there are CO2 emissions associated with that. So the way to optimise that is to choose agricultural areas that are close to quarries, so you reduce the distance. And also within 10 or 20 years, you know, the, the way that we're going with electrification of our um, transportation system is going to mean that that penalty, if you want to call it that, is going to diminish over time as we, as we move forwards. You know, you can build fancy theoretical models, but ultimately the acid test is how does it work in the field? And so actually demonstrating these, this technology in the field with agricultural systems is crucial. So within our consortium then we have a, a team that are looking at the scalability of this, of this technology. How much material would we have to mine and what would be the environmental impacts? And it turns out that the UK is already mining uh, quite a large amount of basalt. And they're mining it for aggregate normally, for road building. And for every tonne of rock they mine, 20% of it is far too fine to be of use to them for aggregate. So if we can use that, those waste products, it's a win-win situation. It's beneficial for us because we're using it to catch carbon and it's beneficial for the mining industry because we are utilising their waste material. So actually there's an opportunity here for building a circular economy and taking this, these stockpiles of basalt and using them to capture carbon and improve food security and soil health. So that's very exciting. There are um, activities going on where you, in, for example, the carbon community in the UK, where they're looking at the co-deployment of reforestation with enhanced weathering. And there's some potentially big wins there because the uh, trees need nutrients to grow and the basalt can provide that. At the same time, the trees form uh, mycorrhizal symbiotic associations with their roots. And we know from previous work that the mycorrhizas absolutely love basalt. They've, they've evolved to mine the basalt and extract the nutrients from it. And so if you apply basalt, you stimulate the mycorrhizas. They get more nutrients, which helps the trees grow better. And at the same time, the mycorrhizas weather the rocks and capture more calm. So it's a very exciting potential co-deployment of two different carbon dioxide removal technologies. And a crucial part of our demonstration is trying to understand or build social intelligence about how the public feel about it. What are the kind of red lines in terms of um, deployment and how are the di different stakeholders feel about it? How do the farming communities feel about it? How do the local public feel about it? You know, it's a bit like nuclear power, you can have the best technology in the world, but if there's, a, if there's a red line that the public won't let you cross, then you can't deploy it. So you really need to understand ahead of time you know, what that situation is. So what we're finding is by taking um, a variety of different techniques, we can really pin down what are the most important processes that we need to understand to measure the amount of carbon dioxide removal. And we can make sure that our models incorporate those processes and parameterize them effectively. And then that will help us moving forwards because when we come to scale these carbon dioxide removal techniques up to a global scale, we need to be making measurements, quantifying the amount of carbon dioxide that's being removed quickly, efficiently, and of course, cheaply.
Yeah, so in summary, if you apply these rocks to the, to the uh, landscape, then they can capture carbon, they can reverse soil acidification, and they can release nutrients, all of which uh, help to increase yields.